increase in oxidative phosphorylation, we can increase aggression in a dose-dependent way. This is the behavioral assay, 10 Bs in a dish. Unrelated B in, as I said, they can tell, and then a large number of them will react uh, aggressively. And when we do this with bees that have been treated, we get a level of aggression that above the band, which is the uh, concurrent. For Drosophila, you use a genetic approach, and we uh, engineer flies that have a change in brain metabolism in D20 gene, which is involved in oxidative phosphorylation. These are the two parental lines that are used to create this genetically engineered. This is where the gene comes from. This particular line uh, allows the gene to be expressed only in the brain to get more specificity. This is a much more refined approach than just injecting into the brain pharmacologically. Fact, we were able to get, do this expressing uh, this particular construct just in neurons or to be able to get more specificity. Either way, you see an increase in aggression. This was pleasing too because honeybee defense is in a social context, um, defending the hive as, as represented by how, however they're transposing that in the little plastic dish. In flies, um, it's very different. They're competing. So these are male male interactions. We're con and we're counting the lunges. So aggression in a very different context, but the brain system is engaged. Similarly, we've seen similar things in stickleback fish and changes in brain metabolism associated with an exposure to the challenger. Again, one of these common things. Okay, um, and then finally, the genes and behavior is highly conserved from animals to humans. So back to the Institute. This is um, one of the multidisciplinary teams that Conrad spoke about, and this, this team is the team that my lab is privileged to work in, uh, gene networks in neural and developmental plasticity. We were able to develop uh, a large-scale project, get funding from the Simons Foundation to be able to ask the question um, in a very robust way um, with three different experimental models. Lisa Stubbs is a mouse geneticist. Allison uh, studies stickleback fish, uh, neurogenomics, and and then my lab in, in honeybees, and then Dave Zai and Saurabh Sinha, our computational genomicists, to help us um, derive new meaning from these data. So here's the question as it is posed, um, and it should be a familiar one by now in this, in this talk. Social information processed by the brain um, involved in some way in a behavioral change. Are those molecular mechanisms, molecular pathways, are there some cons are there conser conservation there in some of the this kind of thing? And the answer is yes. Uh, so I'll just give you some highly processed data, just one slide. Um, so we do the experiment. I'll back up. We do the experiments. We find the differentially expressed genes, the DEGs, and then we can compare them. And yes, there's a highly significant overlap across the three species. And we've done a variety of things with that. One of them is for a particular of genes that are very important in orchestrating changes in gene expression, transcription factors. So I mentioned epigenetics as being important. There are a set of genes that are important in orchestrating uh, gene expression changes. These are the transcription factors. Their job is to turn other genes on and off. They work in combinatorial way, but, but fundamentally you can establish relationships between transcription factors and their target genes. So when we do these overlaps of genes differentially expressed, focusing on transcription factors, we find a set of genes, set of transcription factors. We're using the mouse gene names as the more well-known names, um, but we find very robust genes that are so similar, despite their being in different species, that you can, uh, using statistics, label them as orthologs, if you will. Um, when we do that, we see that there are some transcription factors that are involved in orchestrating changes in gene expression in response to a social challenge uh, of very uh, distant related individuals. So that's the case for animals. Can we go further? That's why we came here today, right? Um, well, here's to start this off, here's a quote from sociobiology. This time I got the year right. It is the task of comparative sociobiology to trace these and other human qualities as closely as possible back through time. So, E.O. Wilson had that vision, but this was beyond science's ability in 1975, and as many of you know, that caused a lot of problems, that assertion, with the inability to serendipitous situation in our, our honeybee studies that led us to address this question. This is now the work of Hagai Spiegler, uh, a postdoc uh, in the laboratory. So, Hagai did all of the work on social change. 
challenge, exposing the bees to unrelated individual in the, lab in the laboratory, the stuff that I just talked about, the bee mouse fish stuff. Um, I did on social challenge, the other opportunity. So a negative valence stimulus and a positive valence stimulus. For mouse and fish, the positive valence, the opportunity was a mating opportunity. For honeybees, it was a rearing opportunity because worker honeybees don't mate. That's the queen's job. Worker's job to do all of the supporting uh, activities and their reproduction occurs through the closely related uh, queen. So the challenge with the the opportunity was to give, again, a dish of bees, a queen larva. Because it doesn't get any better than that if you're a bee to really become a queen. So that was the social opportunity. So when Haggai did the challenge assay, uh, he noted some bees responded strongly and some bees didn't respond. And we um, to study those that did respond. Then one year later, he did the social opportunity uh, assay and he found avidly uh, nurtured. Um, there's trying to get it to grow up to become a queen, and others were just hanging back and not responding. The two things were done years apart. But it led me to ask, well, might there be some unresponsive bees, bees that are just not responding to stimuli? Because that would be an interesting um, observation to assay now, seeing both stimuli, and then asking the question, are there bees that don't respond? And the answer is yes. Here's the ethogram. So responding in different ways. Is the guard bees are red. They are responding strongly to the challenge, but not to the opportunity. The nurse bees are blue, responding strongly to the opportunity, not the challenge. We had a couple of hyperachievers that were responding to both. That's a kind of an aberrant situation, actually, um, because of the strong division of labor. What we did see that, but we also saw about 15% of the bees on average across. These are different colonies, different genetic styles. So uh, is the well, transcriptomics to ask that question. So we compared gene expression. Now we're working in a particular region of the brain that we implicated in the previous study. I didn't mention bodies for those of you studying insect brains. I know there's some great Drosophila folks here today. Um, we used the mushroom bodies and found um, differences. A thousand genes differentially expressed between the unresponsive bees and either the guards or the nurses. This, uh, this DEG list allows us to do the entire treatment of the data. This is a principal component analysis, just to make the point that the individuals more or less cluster separately. So different colors are two different genetic sources or colonies. And the blue bees, the nurses are mostly together. The red bees are mostly together. And the green bees, the unresponsive bees, are mostly together. So this looks like a state. Uh, does it make sense at all? Well, it appears to make sense from the perspective of behavior in the hive, because in another line of study in my lab using the barcoded bees, um, we have been creating uh, basically a Facebook for bees, and that was a much more popular thing to say a couple weeks ago than now, but uh, be that as it may. So we have a camera here, uh, the lighting can't quite everything. Everything's done on, under red light, bees can't see uh, red light. There's a camera here that's aimed at the uh, observation hive so that uh, we get an inch every Second, um, here's the observation hive. These are the bees that are barcoded, and you saw the um, inset right here. So we get an image of every bee, and then in this particular case, what we're looking at is how, com how connected they are to each other. The particular behavior uh, known as social feeding, where they're touching each other's antennae and they're swapping uh, materials. It's not strictly nutritive because it's actually going both ways. Those of you that know primate grooming, like that. It has a lot of social meaning. It's freighted with social, social uh, innuendo and so on and so forth. And so we use that as an indicator and built this work. And when we do that, um, so here's the queen. Um, after one week, the queen had 745 interaction partners, friends, and then 4,368 4, interactions. So that's give the ground truth. She had the most of so the systems working. We just published on it, validated it, and so forth. Be happy to talk with you uh, about this. But my point here is that there's a great deal of variation between individuals. Some bees have almost as much social interaction as the queen. But here is the point that I'm trying to make with respect to what we're talking about. There are some bees that have interactions. One week, 
24-7 continuous monitoring. Some bees have 500, almost 1,000 interactions, and here's like 24 interactions. The idea of seeing socially unresponsive bees in the laboratory does not seem like an artifact. They could be fitting in with this profile uh, here. Did you have a question? Uh, what is this observation? Yes, so these are that the bees can go out freely uh, go, go through a hole in the wall. Yeah, thank you. So we took the DEG list then and compared it to genes that are in autism. Now, I want to emphasize very, very strongly that autism is a very complex human component of it, and I in no way am trying to verify this or speak in a very facile way. Um, bees are not humans, but one component of autism and we have a manifestation of that B, and so we explored it on that basis. Let's be clear about that. There are two sources of information on the genetics or genes involved in autism. Uh, one comes from DNA-based studies looking at variants, um, and this is funded by the Simons Foundation. It's the Safari uh, database. And the other comes from gene expression studies of postmortem uh, brains. We compared our DEG list, our list of about a thousand genes that distinguished the to the gene list available to these studies. And what we found that for the higher confidence genes in the Safari database, there was a significant overlap of the genes on our list and the genes on their list. Uh, pleasingly or encouragingly, that significance goes away when you go to lower quality, uh, lower confidence data sets, sorry, not quality, lower confidence data sets in the Safari database. Um, so that's point one. And then point two, significant overlap on the genes that are differentially expressed in the autism, autism individuals. We tried to do the controls that we could think about. There's always more controls that one could imagine. We've done reciprocal controls. So we've looked at our social unresponsive B gene that compared it to other human data sets that are relevant, mental illness related uh, gene sets, we don't see any significant overlaps. We've done the converse, the autism gene sets that I just showed you, and compared that to uh, other B behavioral sets, the, like you overlap. So now you see that uh, particular overlap, uh, suggesting, uh, again, not that bees are autistic, but that genes are involved are ancient, so have conserved roles, and can be involved in evolutionary independent instantiations of social behavior, and in particular, social responsiveness. So that's one point in this last part of the talk, and then here's the last point, and then we'll be wrapping up. So um, another way that we look at ancient and how their world system um, can be involved in motivating social behavior. So I think we're all pretty comfortable with this construct here. Um, uh, it's a little bit of a reach because people tend to think of insect brains, and rightly so, as, as uh, perhaps simpler. And um, so do we need to invoke a reward system when we can think about a simpler concept like a stimulus response? But I think it's helpful to try, and I'll show you some data that I think support that notion. It's helpful to try because then we can kind of think about this. So they're addicted to might they be addicted to altruism? These are all bona fide cases of the kind of products of an structure, construction, warfare, and culture. So magnificent accomplishments. These are all traits that kind of change the face of the planet for better or for worse, um, especially in our hands. And um, they're all present in sex societies. They're all based altruism associated with the genetic structure of an insect society and is it possible to imagine that one contribution to all of this is um, an addiction that we're a manipulation of the reward system so that these behaviors are are motivated so I'll give you some information from our honeybee studies that supports the uh, scouts who prefer uh, this waggle dance, um, which communicates uh, information on distance, direction, and value of the food that they are looking at. Uh, experiments with robots have shown that this uh, communication system is about 50% uh, effective at communicating. I've been married for 36 years. 50% communication efficiency is very good. So, so this is the system that the bees have. And so we asked the question of, when you see this kind of motivated behavior, um, might you imagine putting it in the context of the reward system? So what we did was we looked at one particular uh, 
biogenic amine, a neurochemical called octopamine, closely related to dopamine. Many of you know dopamine colloquially as the pleasure juice of the brain. And uh, the reason why we looked at octopamine was because experiments in Drosophila have shown, in the fruit fly, have shown that uh, octopamine is involved in mediating food seeking behavior and um, the response to food. And so that was, a, that was a strong motivation. So we wanted to see whether the behavior in Drosophila had co-opted structure dance behavior. Because one thing I forgot to say is that when a solitary uh, organism finds good food, it eats more. When a honeybee finds good food, she does not eat more. She collects about the same amount, goes back to the hive, and dances more. So there's been a me to we transposition the organism the food. So the honeybee collects the food, barely eats any, brings it back to the hive, and dances more. So what we did is we took advantage of the fact that the dance language is a finely tuned system. That is, bees only dance if the food is really high quality. So, um, you know, like if you go out to an amazing restaurant, it's great, you're going to write a yellow. If you find a terrible source, you do the same thing. But if it's so-so, you probably just won't say anything. So likewise, bees find a food source that's great or that they'll recruit for. They find a marginal food source. They may use it themselves go back and forth a little bit, but they're not going to dance for it. So what we did is we found, we titrated using a large field enclosure um, that we uh, have next to the bee lab, and we titrated the food reward, the sugar reward, so that the control bees were barely dancing. 10% of the bees were dancing. And we jacked them up with octopamine, and we can triple the number of bees that are dancing. So yes, they are using the system, and that's minimal dance behavior. So to extend this, we took advantage of perhaps a little known compound called cocaine and also extended the findings. So this is the microgram of topamine. This is the cocaine treatment. Biochemically, I will share with you, it's a trivial experiment because cocaine exists in nature as an insecticide to kill insects. The way it kills insects is it's an octopamine reuptake inhibitor. That is, it prevents octopamine between neurons, synapses, and then causing higher levels of octopamine neurotransmission. So the neurons never calm down, the insects twitch and shake, and they die. So that's how cocaine exists. The reason why it may be known to some of you, and that's none of my business, is that um, it also interacts with the human dopamine system because cocaine and octopamine are so chemically similar. So from the biochemical perspective, this was a trivial experiment, but to push this reward concept, those of us that have done experiments know stranger things have happened. We want to see whether it would behave as it was predicted to behave, and it was. And then finally, um, when we add an octopamine blocker, it also blocks the cocaine effect. So we could get bees to be three times more likely to dance than an optional food source. So these are the scouts that are doing dancing. The genes that distinguish the scouts, what top-down approach. There's a literature on novelty seeking in vertebrates. Some genes have been implicated in humans. And we looked at that subset of genes, and we found that using that subset of genes, one could find strong differences in gene expression between scouts and non-scouts, um, sufficient to be able to distinguish uh, most of the bees. Not a great uh, pattern there, in part because there's so much genetic variation from colony to colony. But strong differences, and then something that I won't show you that really nails it, is that when we manipulate some of these systems using pharmacological treatment, we can turn non-scouts into scouts and scouts into non-scouts. So kind of closing the loop there that these ancient evolutionary conserved uh, reward system related compounds are in the system. Again, um, make the following point that, that I want to emphasize here. So, um, here we have the lineages leading up to the insect society. The last common ancestor lived some 600 million years ago. It's thought to be a marine flatworm with a very, very primitive, not a centralized brain. No social life to speak of as far as we know. And the point for me uh, showing this to you is for you to appreciate the context in which we're not saying that is novelty seeking. We're not seeking, saying that social unresponsiveness is autism. We're saying that there's some genes that have been used and reused in evolutionarily independent events of social behavior. And so think of it perhaps as, a, as the 
You need particular molecular pathways to be involved in social behavior for whatever reason, reason we don't know yet. Who are you going to call? You call these systems repeatedly. That's an analogy that actually is now working better since Ghostbuster 2 came out. It was getting long in the tooth um, when it was only Ghostbusters 1 and people like us would know it, but to summarize, I want to come back to this, these last two slides that I showed you, but now with a little more information. Animal models are revealing the real relationship between genes and behavior. Um, using these examples, we see dynamic genome action across time scales. We see context, uh, context dependence uh, affecting gene expression. Uh, ancient co-opting system, scalpies uh, addicted to altruism. There are other uh, parallel stories in other species, wasps and voles, where you see basic molested in voles, the oxytocin system. System, um, various involved in various kinds of nurturing, including possibly uh, romantic uh, uh, attachments, and so a lot of like taking basic building blocks and using them in different uh, contexts. So one point is DNA is not destiny, and I want to all even DNA is not. What do I mean by that? So a very provocative study that was just published in Science uh, shows that early life experience can trigger in mice can trigger different behavior of, of elements, genetic elements cause tra called transposable elements that can insert themselves in the genome in different places and then give rise, really kind of play havoc with basic patterns of gene expression or at least change them. So now this is not, all this stuff here is R, at the RNA level, this stuff here is at the DNA level, apparently able to get to the DNA level. Paper so far, the implications of this we, we don't know, but really very provocative. And then I'll go so uh, for those of you that saw Gattaca, um, uh, a lot of strong evidence for multiple higher order interactions, a paper just gene interactions with predictable types. So um, it would take an amazing amount of knowledge uh, and ability to even imagine being a human based on the data that are from yeast. So where are we? We're poised for this new understanding of human um, taking traditional models of personality uh, that are state trait models, using these evolutionary informed models from animals to be able to get at personality traits are not either tabula rosa or biological meaning set in stone, but this new model that is interested in policy applications and has been discussing them with, uh, with Professor Heckman as well. Um, and then, of course, uh, kind of the money points would be related to assessment and intervention in that context. Um, the work here uh, that was done here at University of Chicago, headed by John Campbell, basically saying it's kind of all in your head. That this study was notable um, not only because it was the first uh, study uh, of a, a social trait, but um, the evidence for differences in gene expression and by the way, these were in human leukocytes, blood cells, not, not brain, for obvious reasons. The, the evidence, uh, the connection was closer for self-reporting measures of loneliness rather than objective measures. So the individual, and uh, by an objective measure, they also were self-reporting. And the connection was stronger uh, for the self-reporting. And uh, we've done a study like that as well. So able to uh, measure distance, as uh, I mentioned, that's part of the dance language. We train bees to think they went a further distance by tricking them basing, bakes, based on knowing how they measure distance. Thinking that they do a longer distance showed the long distance dance pattern, uh, gene expression pattern, excuse me, rather than the short distance. I could tell you more uh, about that. All in your head um, is, uh, is also something that extends. Uh, the MAOA gene I mentioned uh, has been uh, introduced as evidence in court. So far, not during the trial phase, the sentencing phase. Why do I know that? We teach at the Institute courses uh, for professionals, genomics for judges, genomics for state's attorneys, genomics for doctors. Uh, I learned about sending in. So the MAOA gene, because it has a genome by environment uh, a body of data to support it, has been brought in. My client, a low, lesser sentence because of extenuating environmental circumstances. And then um, this paper here that I mentioned, but I now give a little bit of things very nicely. Brain and behavior develop over time. Um, genes are always expressed in context, and epigenetics is now seen as experience. And hopefully you saw some examples of that from the honeybee. So we're at a moment um, where we want to try to integrate this, so it's that we have. 
We need better ways to measure brain gene expression um, in humans. If this is an important uh, facet that needs to be uh, added to trying to build it, then uh, this is important. Right now we have uh, autopsy or blood cells as markers. Uh, might we think of ways of using in new ways to get at um, environmental effects? Um, might there be new imaging methods? Uh, there was just a paper on disembodied pig brains. Um, might we be able to be using, uh, using them in, in some way? I don't know. Um, but uh, the current uh, two levels that we have uh, do, limit, uh, do limit our progress. So it is something, uh, something to think about. We're actually working on some imaging methods that I'd be happy to, uh, to talk with any of you about. So let me thank the people whose work I spoke about. Hopefully I managed to mention uh, most, if not others, at the Institute as well as beyond some of the technical genomic resources that we use and our funding agencies. And thank you very much. Thanks, Jane. Now, okay. great lecture. Um, uh, time. Delighted to, yeah. Questions, comments? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a fascinating question. Everyone here in the back, uh, of them more connected to others, uh, other bees than other roles, uh, how might that might be manifest in their need for social interaction? Yeah, it's a test that kind of thing because they are really distinct roles, but we don't have any information on it now. That's a really cool question. very important, and I think it is uh, of it. So I'll, I'll have to admit, I wrote a couple pieces in 2004 um, to set the stage for this. It was an op-ed piece in the New York Times. I say that on purpose to say that I thought, oh, okay, yeah, I'm done. This is, this is now, the synthesis is going to happen. I think that the question might, the issue might be that, yeah, that may not have been contextualized right, and how to build those connections across disciplines, a lot more work than just Right, one thing and sit back, and hence the visit here. Yeah, exactly. Yes. More informal comparison, um, but in that spirit. And so the genes that we looked at, where we saw the big differences uh, between scouts and structure, the principal analysis, those were genes that came by gleaning the literature for that. So the difference is that most of that work was still done on genetics known as the candidate paradigm, which has largely been um, uh, left behind. And the autism work has been more a uh, thing. I got a question. Yes. For our team, for our team. Um, there's some great work coming out on the role of uh, antimicrobial so some of uh, uh, Moran's work has suggested that there's a relationship between uh, antimicrobial activity and dancing behavior that were altered. Yeah. Um, with that, I mean, yeah. you probably call that under environment. You didn't say microbiome once in your talk. <laughs> that. But uh, in, in that space, I mean, you know, if you took those uh, animals, the, the bees that weren't uh, interacting, if you looked at their microbiome, would you expect to see difference? Been, uh, not in as much as should. We've done one study that compared uh, nurses and foragers as two very different states with where 40% different and many different neurochemical, structural differences. This is all a setup to say that we didn't see any differences there. Now, we did this about eight years ago. The methods, thanks to you are, and others, are, are way more sophisticated. But we really need to uh, get back and do this. We have a collaboration with the Moran Lab to try to get this uh, more instantiated. It should be based on what you see in other organisms. Uh, 
Um, we weren't we were disappointed but not shocked with our result because they are constantly exchanging material with a you know colony level microbiome that is um, superseding a behavioral specific one but it's a very rich area so isolated bees compared to groups and so forth yeah yes Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we didn't, we didn't uh, study that. And so what we want to do is to be able to have our automated detection system running on all behaviors so that we could just say, that's a great question, and then just punch it in and get that information. So we're close enough to almost be able to taste what it would be like, but we're not there yet, so we have to do the lab assays that looked at those behaviors, and then we only have a couple behaviors um, automated. Yeah, so um, I'll just give the context by repeating what I did for seven weeks, just to give you that background. And then they start working in the hive, um, and then graduate and work outside the hive. The, within the hive, the roles usually last a few days for each one, and then they move along. So they're a nurse for about five to for another four to ten, four to six days. Um, foraging usually is something that they do for the rest of their life. Specialization. So I'm a scout, a recruit, but they're foraging continually. Then there's some other really weird jobs that they all, but very intensely. So uh, corpse removal is a job that only a few bees do, and they only do it uh, for like a day or two, and they do it very bee life, as by waves, by waves of, the, of bee life, and um, strong individual specialization. We once studied a bee pre barcode day, so colored number that collected water from the same location for 17 days. Exactly the same location. It was fun. Um, it, it happened that way. So there's individual specialization um, layered on top of that. So an experiment we're thinking of doing by bringing together genomes and, um, and uh, large-scale automated behavioral monitoring is a kind of a Truman story uh, experiment. You saw the movie, Con monitoring uh, of all that, having all this information to put together. These, these profiles. Yes? Do you have any idea what prompts the transitions from role to role? I mean, what yeah, so um, there is a, a set of hormones that kind of time their behavioral match hormone work to time sexual maturity. In this case, they're not maturing sexually because they don't do that. But, um, but it's the same kind of uh, mechanisms that are timing their maturation, and it's a play on the solitary life. So solid, So what's nice about bees is it's easy to say something over 19,000 extant species, solitary bees, some of which have been studied, and so we know. So the solitary life is you emerge as an adult, you lay an egg, and forage and provision for it. So what you see in this division of labor is this lay an egg, like, and take care of it inside the nest has been accentuated. And then the um, and then the foraging phase has been extended as well. So you know, I don't have a bar mitzvah. That's right. But there is extended adolescence in the in the uh, case, and that's again a feature of periods of life that um, make the individuals more more vulnerable and more connected to each other. We have one more question, if there is one. Yes. So the, the general contours of these kinds of our, our, our results can be seen. The ecologies are very different, so then giving, it gives a different context. So for example, ants are closely related to bees, and yet they don't fly, and, so they, and they're predators rather than, than vegans. And so how they go about making their nest and collecting their food is very different, but nevertheless, they have a very similar role. They have foragers, they have individuals that in the nest, they have guards, and so forth. How it plays out differs somewhat, but the broad strokes are the same.
you. Thank From you the flip much. side. Very good. Thanks for the lovely introduction. Uh, yeah, good to see you, Khan. Thank yeah, you for the kind introduction. Oh, Some bees twitch, like sublethal dose of pesticides, if they test in different ways, like if they're affecting the microbiome. 